but we need to want to know more about Jesus. I think Ms. Betty Hobbs, she likes to sing that song, More About Jesus, What I Know. And that's, that's why we're here, to glorify and magnify Him. So we've been dealing with some things about God, studying God. So let's read this passage. I think it goes in hand with our whole series, down to verse number 8, beginning in verse 1, Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto Him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto Him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all His works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Verse 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. There are certain things about God we can understand a little bit better than others. I can understand how God gets angry at people. Sometimes I get pretty angry at people as well. I can understand how he can, the frustration and the indignation can burn with God. And some of the things that we study about God are what we call communicable attributes. That means they can be communicated. We can agree and understand them. We were made originally in God's image. So I can understand some of those things. I can understand how God can love someone. I can understand how God can have mercy and how God can have compassion. I can understand some of those attributes. But other things... I simply can't understand. They're harder to grasp. And some things about God, quite frankly, on this side of heaven, we're never going to understand. The scientists, they're okay with not knowing anything as long as they think they can know it at some point in time. They're not good with the unknown. I'm okay with the unknown regarding God because God's God. And I can accept that He is so awesome and so magnificent that I can't grasp, fully grasp and understand. And like I've said before in the study as we've gone through this, there's some things you can get up here and some things you can only get down here. Some things only the Spirit of God will let you know. And we get to studying these things and we say, well, how is it? Is it all about just what the Bible says about God? Well, the Bible gives us a lot about Him. This is called supernatural special revelation. Revelation out in nature, that's that's natural revelation. God lets us know some things about Him by the creation that He's given us. But God's given us special revelation, supernatural written revelation, where He explains Himself. He say, He talks about how coming under the shadow of His wings, God is not a chicken. But He's using an analogy to try to help me better understand some of God's attributes. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, an author, he illustrated things this way. Suppose you were in a room and it was just you, nobody there, nobody else had access to the room. Maybe it's your apartment, you're the only one that has a key, nobody has a key. You have two glasses on your table, one of them's got about, you know, it's about halfway full. And the other one's empty. One of them's, uh, they're two different glasses, you know they're different from one to the other. Well, you get up and you leave. Directly you come back, nobody else has been in your house. You go in there and you look, and here's the glass sitting here, and here's the glass that had the water in it. Now the water's in the other glass. And it's not just the same amount that's in the glass, there's added water in that glass. How are you going to explain that? There's some things when we come to with God that we can't wrap our finite minds around because like our last last lesson, God is infinite. He is limitless. We measure everything because we're created. He's the uncreated one. Now we're going to talk tonight about the eternality of God. The fact that God is the eternal God. It's also called the non-temporality of God. In other words, it ties into the infinitude of God that we've already discussed. And uh, it has to do not just with space. When you talk about God's infinity, when it relates to space, it has to do with what we call the omnipotence with God. That means God's everywhere in space. There's not a place you can go that God's not going to be there. You say, well, I'm going to go hide in my room. Well, God's already there before you get there. You say, well, I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to go 100 miles this way. Well, God's already there. You say, well, I'm going to jump up and get up in an airplane and go up there. God's there. You say, I'm going to dig a hole and get down in the hole. God's there. That's God's infinitude in relation to space. God's infinitude in relation to time is the fact that He's eternal. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. I'll give you a few verses And you don't have to turn to them, we're going to turn to some later. These are verses that simply state from the Scripture the fact of God's eternity. 1 Timothy 1, 7. Now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Psalm 93, verse 2. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Isaiah 40, verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. Isaiah 63, 16. Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Deuteronomy 32, 27. The eternal God is thy refuge. He's not just some God of the Jewish tribe. He's not just God, God of some nomadic tribe back there. He's not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not just the God of the Christians, the God of the Jews. He's the eternal God. He's the everlasting God. He is the God that's always been here, always will be here. He not only dwells in space, He's outside of space. He's the eternal God. Let's try to define this a little bit biblically and, and logically. We've got to put on our thinking caps sometimes when you come to the Bible. David kind of has that attitude when he goes to the Psalms. He'll say, standing, standing on, sin not. In other words, just meditate on God. Sometimes put your thinking cap on and begin to meditate from the scriptural vantage point about God. I believe it's healthy to do that. Now, what, what, is, this, what is God's eternity? I'll tell you what it's not. God's e- eternality is not in la- in non-ending days. That's not it. Uh, in, in some sense, a few times in the Bible, the word eternal is used from one point forward. For instance, I have eternal life, but I haven't always had eternal life because I haven't always existed. I've been born in time. So in that sense, and when I have eternal life, I've got something now that's never going to stop from this point forward. But it had a starting place. So I hope you understand that. There's a passage in Genesis 49. He talks about the everlasting hills. Well, you know the hills aren't everlasting going back that way. They might be everlasting from this point forward. He's going to remake and make a new heavens and a new earth. We understand all that. So sometimes the Bible will use it in that sense. Very seldom. Most of the time when it uses the word eternal and every time when it uses it in relation to God, it's not speaking of God as in never-ending days because... The word eternal is not used in relation to created things from one point forward. It's used in a stricter sense. It's an infinite number of moments. If you think about an infinite number of moments, that would be impossible. Because to get to this place, you say, well, I'm here after an infinite number of moments. No, that can be traversed and thought about and calculated. So it's not never-ending days. That's not an accurate um, depiction or definition of the eternality of God. If uh, you had an infinite number of moments occurring before today, today never would have come. Everybody with me? What am I saying here? I'm simply saying this. Endless time is not eternity. Endless time is just more of time. When you begin to study Revelation, you study some things, you think about eternity and all this kind of stuff, we always just want to think in ways of time because we are bound, we are limited by time. Everything's the clock. The limitations we've set on the clock nonetheless, but everything is tick-tock, tick-tock. Everything's based on time. Eternity is not uh, endless time. Our problem is we see things succeeding one another. Uh, one theologian said this, We see all things as events that succeed one another. Their occurrence is separated by a longer or shorter period of duration. That's how we view and measure everything like we studied with the infinitude lesson. So what is God's eternality? What, what is it? It's timelessness. There's no time involved at all. It's not a whole bunch of days that never stop because that can be measured. This is timelessness. I'll give you a definition of another theologian. He defines it as this, that perfection of God whereby He is elevated above all temporal limits and all succession of moments and possesses the whole of His existence in one indivisible present. What does that mean? He's not in the past. He's not just right now only, and He's not in the future. He is outside of time. He inhabits eternity. You say, how can that be? Because Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. God creates this thing that we're in right now called time. God is eternal. It's timelessness. God not only made the ages, God is before the ages. If you could go back and you think, okay, let me go back. And I like to study history. I've read some stuff on the history of Monticello and Jefferson County. And that stuff's neat. I love some nostalgia on different things. 
and you go back and you think, okay, let me go back 50 years. Let me get out the, the old yearbooks and let me get out this and look at how the street was here and how this was here and this old house used to be there and it burned down. Let me go back. Let's keep rewinding. Let's go back to your parents' time before you were even here and let's think back of you know, some of the stuff you've seen with them and go back maybe their grandparents. And if you can keep going back and you go get the genealogical records and you, you'll go back to great, great, great grandpa and I've got some Cherokee over here and I've got some Confederate in me over here and I've got some, you know, and you go back and get all that stuff. And let's just keep going back before um, the white man was over here. You just got the Indian killing each other left and right. Let's just keep going back, you know, when you got the Roman Empire and the Greece Empire and you go back and you got the Persians and let's just keep just go back in Bible times where you have Solomon as the great greatest king over the entire... Let's just keep going back and going back and going back. There's Abraham. Let's go back before that. There's Noah. There's the flood. 1,700 years. We're getting close. Keep going back. There's Adam and Eve in the garden. Keep going back. There's nobody. And keep going back, and you got Lucifer and all the stuff that took place, Isaiah 14, Genesis 1, verse 2, all that kind of stuff. Keep going back, there's nothing but God. He's eternal. He's before the ages. Jesus said in John 17, Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. 2 Timothy 1, 9, Who hath saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Titus 1, 2, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God was here before this world. He's eternal. Time doesn't begin before the universe begins. God created time. So He's on the outside of time. He's not limited by time in any bit. That's why He already knows what's going to happen. Like I said, the infinitude of God, it relates to space with His immensity. He fills heaven and earth. He says, Solomon, he goes, Solomon says, I built this temple, Lord, but you, you know, this ain't just for you. You fill everything. And the Lord's like, yeah, I'm, you're right. I do. I fill everything. David said in Psalm 139, Whither shall I flee from thy presence? You know, if I go down in hell, you're there. If I go to heaven, you're, you're everywhere. But in relation to time, God's eternal. He's outside of it. Now, how do we defend this? Obviously, by the Scriptures, I've given you the verses on God's etern- eternality. But what about some of the other attributes? We've studied God's immutability. That simply means God can't change. Now, think about this for a minute. Everything in time changes. The scientists tell us there's a law of thermodynamics. That means uh, one part of it is there's there's entropy in a closed system. That means things break down everywhere. If you take a freezer you say, I'm going to put up these, these collard greens, I'm going to put these things up. You can put them in there, but you leave them in there 55 years, they're not going to be fitting to eat. I still got some alligator meat I got to eat in the freezer. I hope it ain't gone bad. I didn't kill it. It was, it was given to me. The game warden sitting on the back row back there. I don't care how long you say, I'm going to freeze it, I'm going to preserve it, I'm going to do such and such. Well, the Egyptians were pretty good at stuff. Man, they had some technology down where they could suck your brains out your nose and do all kind of stuff and mummify you and put the, uh, the, the stuff in. And Man, they could, they could do some things to preserve the skin a long time. You're still dead. And you give it enough time, you take that mummified corpse there and you unwrap it and you set it there and, and let it sit long enough. The wind's going to come along and start blowing that thing. It's just going to crack and, and crumble. And it's just like God said, it's dust. Everything breaks down in time. God doesn't change. God doesn't break. He doesn't get old. He doesn't, you know, have a limp after a few years or, or get hurt or, or, or have things break down in his, in his composure, in his, in his composition. God is immutable all across the board. That mean, that is a proof that he cannot be in time. Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, was in time and grew and changed. The man Christ Jesus. And we'll get into this in a second. So the mutability of God is another way to defend God's eternality, but God's infinity. He is infinite, so He has no limits. Time brings limits to all of us. Unfortunately, guess what's going to happen in the morning? Your alarm clock's going to go off. And your boss is going to be waiting on you, and it's going to be time to go to work, except for those who retired, Brother Howard. Amen. And you know that thing? It brings limits. There's always a limit. There's always a constraint. But God's infinite. There's no limit on Him. He's not in time. He's not bound by it. Has no hold on Him like it does us. 
The clock. We're chasing after the clock. We're worried about the sun going down. It doesn't bother him. It's defended by those attributes. It's also defended by the fact that he's the uncreated God. He's separate from his creation. Um, creating doesn't affect his nature. It comes out of him. He creates things by the breath of his mouth, like we read in Psalm 33, but it doesn't affect him. There's no change in who God is when he creates, only in what he does. But there's no change in the person of God just because he created the world and just because he created Lucifer. And this helps bring some little bit of a clarity. You know, we, we become our own uh, sun and with our own solar system with everything revolving around us. And we need to realize God's not any better because you're here. And God's not any greater because you're saved and any of that. God is God, and if the whole world just went to hell tomorrow, it wouldn't change God. We need to get off this high horse that everything's about us and, and you know, American Idol and, and everything's just centered around how great, how talented, how the things that come into the church. They're calling this a stage nowadays and everything's about performances and everything's about all this because all the focus wants to be on a person. All the focus is people want it on them. God's God. He's the uncreated one, and because He made you, He's not any better. And if He didn't make you, He wouldn't be any worse. Thank God He made us. And thank God He redeemed us and saved us from hell and saved us from sin. He, he bought us. He purchased us. Thank God for that, but it didn't affect Him. God's God. It's defended, but it's also demonstrated. I believe it's demonstrated by the birth of Christ. And I want to point, on, point this out because we mentioned it earlier. God has no past or future. What are you going to do with Jesus? Turn over to Isaiah 9, verse 6. I want you to see this. I quote it quite often, and it's very profound. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. is very profound how it's worded. Isaiah 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Obviously, that's a reference to the deity of Christ. But notice in verse 6 how it's worded. The child is born. The son is given. There was no part of the deity of Christ, the partless God, that was affected by him becoming a man. That didn't change at all. His deity did not become humanity. And his humanity didn't become deity. We have to equally understand and equally appreciate both natures of Christ. Thank God he was a man. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are. James 1, God can't be tempted. He suffered. You mean God's going to suffer? He died. You mean God's going to die? God can't die. But the man Christ Jesus went through some of the very same things we experience and we go through. When he was tempted by Satan, the same three temptations that Adam and Eve faced, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those same three main temptations that we all face in one aspect or another, Christ was presented with and tempted by as a man. And he rejected the temptation, and he denied the temptation, and he followed God. He was victorious. But I want you to understand, we talk about God, and we talk about his, uh, his eternal nature. The child is born, but Jesus has always existed. The Son is from everlasting. You need to understand that. I believe the birth of Christ demonstrates the eternal nature of God. Sometimes Jesus would talk and he would say, you know, he, he gives statements like the Son is subject unto the Father, as, the, as I live by the Father. He would make statements. One time it says, when Jesus perceived that they said such and such. Like he didn't know what they were talking about. He gets, he gets tired and has to go to sleep. The Bible says God doesn't sleep. He's not weary. We read one one verse in Isaiah 40. He's not weary. Jesus got wearied with his journey, John 4, and sat on the well. So sometimes it sounds like, man, Jesus is a man. Then other times, the Bible says, when he knew their thoughts. Other times when he holds up his arms and says, peace, be still. When he says, Lazarus, come forth. When he says, I and my father are one. When he says, before Abraham was, I am. There's God. He tells Philip, he says, you want to see the Father? Look into these eyes. Can you imagine looking into the eyes of Jesus? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Can you imagine John? Back in the day, whenever they would uh, have communion and things like that, they would, uh, when they would sit at a table, it wasn't like European style sitting at a table. They were kind of like Orientals. They were kind of on the floor. And it was almost like John was laying there on his bosom, it says over there in the John's account. 
John, I believe, was the youngest of the disciples, and I believe he was like a younger brother figure. I believe he was probably the Lord's cousin. We don't have time to get into all that. But I believe he's laying there right next to that heartbeat. The heartbeat of God. That just blows my mind. He says over in 1 John and in John chapter 1, he says, who's, who, he says the word of life, he goes, who, who, who we, whose hands have handled of the word of life. We, we touched him, we handled him. Obviously, that's the man, that's the incarnation, Christ Jesus, but it's a sinless man. He's the second Adam. He's man like God originally intended. But he's God. He's eternal. Now, how do we know this? Okay. We know what happened in the crucifixion story. Jesus Christ was betrayed by Judas. He was led out to be condemned to be condemned to die. But we know that that particular day, Pilate had this thing. It was a custom of that day that during the time of Passover, one prisoner would be pardoned, would be released. And there was a man named Barabbas there. And Pilate said, okay, you got a choice here. I can let Barabbas go. He was a political zealot. He was one of these guys that rose against the government, and he had even killed somebody in this big insurrection they had made against the government. He was a murderer. And he says, you want Barabbas or Jesus? Well, you know what happened. They said, crucify him. Not Barabbas, but Jesus. And so Jesus Christ went to the cross in place of Barabbas. But what does the gospel teach? 1 Corinthians 15, I deliver to you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for Barabbas according to the Scriptures. That he, is that what it says? No. Christ died for our sins. So when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die for Barabbas, although he did die for Barabbas. And, and he, uh, no doubt, Barabbas had to understand the importance of the fact that this guy's taking my place. Whether he had theologically everything figured out or not, we probably, he probably didn't. But he knew one thing, I'm getting out and he's having to get in. He's going to die and I get to live. He's going to be crucified. I'm going to be set free. That He knew that. But when Jesus died on the cross, there was more than just something taking place in time. There's something that is able to stretch all the way back from Adam to all the way to the last person. And that's because Jesus Christ is not just any man hanging on the cross. The blood that flowed through his veins, Acts 20, verse number 28, was God's blood. So do you have it figured out? No, I don't. That's why the Bible calls it the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3, 16. So the death and the atonement of Christ, how can he pay the sin debt for everyone, past, present, and future, not just Barabbas, unless there's something that is eternal about that blood flowing through the veins? Bible in Hebrews, it talks about he, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot. How is it that that blood that was shed on Calvary's cross can still make atonement for everybody? Here we are 2,000 years later, unless it's eternal. So when these theologians go along and say it wasn't the blood of Christ that saves, it's just the death of Christ, put them in wastebasket number 13 over there. It's demonstrated by the death of Christ, but it's also demonstrated by the suffering and the eternal punishment of Christ. And we won't go stay long here. Isaiah 53, it says, Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. When he hung on the cross, he said, I thirst. There's more going on there. He's on the cross for six hours. There's more going on than just a six-hour period. He is suffering eternal judgment. Now, maybe we don't appreciate what Jesus did. Maybe we just think, okay, you know, like the Catholics, everything's just the physical brutality of it. And yes, it was physically brutal. But there's been a lot of people in the history of man that have been tortured. I've got a book back in my office. It's not a, you know, this is real exhorting and encouraging. It's called The History of Torture. I don't recommend you read that. A lot of people have suffered a lot of things. Jesus suffering physically is not what saved you. His blood was shed for your atonement. But the Bible says in Isaiah 53, Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. There's something that's going on of an eternal nature. 
So when he takes in the judgment of God, he's taking in the eternal. Hey, when, when, God, when the condemnation of sin fell on me and fell on you, it wasn't just, okay, I'm going to throw you down in hell for a couple hours and I'm going to pull you back up and let you go in New Jerusalem. No, it's I'm going to throw you down in hell for eternity. And the reason people are changing, and theologians nowadays, neo-Orthodox theologians are getting away from the eternity, eternality of God because they want to do away with the eternal punishment of God. Here's the thing, if God's eternal and you're going to have to pay to an eternal God, how long is it going to last? The punishment of hell can only be eternal because you're outside of time. How are you going to stop something when it's outside of time? And finally, the resurrection of Christ demonstrates it. Here's Jesus. He dies on the cross. He descends into the earth. You know Ephesians chapter 4 and all the things that takes place there. Three days, the Bible says he rises from the dead. Death cannot hold him. What did we talk about when we talked about time? Time has limits. Time has boundaries. There's a measurement to our life. We have a value of life. Even in the Bible, they put a value on time with people's lives. Has no hold on Jesus. Comes up from the grave. Has no hold. He has, he has complete victory over what time condemns and how time destroys. The resurrection of Christ. God can't die. Jesus rose from the dead. And then the prophecy of Jesus Christ in the Bible. Isaiah 46, verse number 10. He says, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. A lot of these knuckleheads out here that deny the Bible and they have all these intellectual reasons I have found that it's not intellectual problems that they're having. Most of the time, there are moral issues involved. I mean, if it's really intellectual problems and they're having all these issues, okay, you know, your mother, you know, you love your mother. Why do you love your mother? She's just DNA is all she is. You're supposed to dance to the tune of DNA. That's what the new atheists tell you to do. Just dance with the tune. DNA rules everything. Okay, she's just DNA molecules. Can I, I, if I want to eat her finger, I'll eat her finger. What's the big deal? There's no value to life when you reason God away. There's a moral problem with the new athe- with atheism. Fool of said in his heart, there is no God. God says, you want reason? You want, you want to have some proof? God says, I'll give you some proof. Number one, I'll rise again from the dead, and he shows himself to 500 people. That's pretty good proof. <laughs> Bible says many, he showed himself by many infallible proofs. I'll give you another proof. You never find my bones. Never found his bones. What are you going to do with it? They still can't get around the empty tomb. The tomb is still empty after all these years. Don't you know after just a little bit of those disciples setting the world all up fire and, and causing, I mean, you know, over Peter preaches and 3,000 get saved, and over there in other few chapters he preaches, 5,000 get saved. You start having this revival after Christ rises from the dead. Don't you know if they had the means to do it, they would have said, okay, here's his bones. They'd have shut it down fast. Can't shut it down. Why? Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hinge pin upon which all Christianity rests. He's God. Can't kill him. And the prophecy of Christ, he says, I'll get this to where I was going with this. I'll give you a reason. Here's the reasons right here. And he gives all these details that come true. That's beyond mathematical probability. He even gives 12 things. He says, okay, I'm going to the cross. Peter, James, John tells him, he goes, I'm going to give you 12 details. This is what's going to happen. Boom, 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 boom. Before he even goes, Jesus exercised the ministry of prophet while he was on the earth. He's a high priest now, and he's coming back as king. Amen. But he tells the future before it happens because he's eternal. He's outside of time. Now, I want to go to Psalm 90. We're going to land the plane. We see the effects of time all around us. And I'm very well aware of where I am in the time clock. And I, I'll be honest with you, I get a little discouraged about it sometimes. You know, I look back and say, man, what do I do with those years? I don't know how I many, none of aren't you glad the Lord don't tell you when you're going to die? I'm so thankful. It could be tomorrow and I'm just going around happy like everything's good, you know. I'm glad he doesn't tell us. I'm glad he doesn't tell us when the rapture is either because we'd all go out and spend all our money on our credit cards, you know. I mean, we'd just blow it. We'd have we'd leave the earth with a bad reputation, <laughs> with unpaid debts. He doesn't tell us those things He because we can't, we can't handle it. 
He said, well, I don't know why God don't do this, and I can't. If God's really God, he let me know. No, you better be glad. As one theologian said, yeah, I think it, was G, it wasn't a theologian, it was uh, G.K. Chesterton. He said this, he said, if the infinite mind could grasp the finite, finite God, his head would burst. You can't handle it. You can't, you can't handle being eternal. You can't handle knowing past, present, and future all at once. We operate in this little bracket right here. And it can be discouraging. You look back and say, man, wasted, what's the old song? Wasted years. Oh, how foolish. You can't brood over all your losses all the time. That's a waste of time in and of itself. But we look around and we see everything that's affected by time. We, we have to do funerals. We have to see people get sick. People die. We watch our own bodies deteriorate. We see the effects. We watch our country go from, man, you read some things about the revolution. I've been reading some stuff about the Revolutionary War. Man, I want to go get my musket. I mean, it is, it's exciting. Man, I'd follow George Washington anywhere. Good night. What a man of, of integrity and character. He got baptized by a Baptist preacher. And uh, I, I, you read those things, you look at our country and some of the things it did, some of the revivals that took place, some of the mission efforts, and, and then you begin to look at how just, it's just steadily going. It can really, you see the effects of time all around us. It can be discouraging. But look in Psalm 90, verse number 4. Well, back up to verse number 1. Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever Thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. Thou turnest men to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in Thy sight are but as yesterday, when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with the flood, they are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. That song, I'll Fly Away, is not talking about the rapture, it's talking about dying. Go back and read it when you get a chance. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Verse 12, here's the lesson. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The effects of time are all around us, but because we're believers in Christ, we're plugged into the eternal one. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10 but now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, This corruptible, speaking of those that have died, shall put on incorruption. And this mortal, those that like us were headed to die, shall put on immortality. When I got saved and when you got saved, he gave us everlasting life. So when I look around, I see the effects of time, and I look down, and I say, Man, I have wrinkles. That really doesn't matter. I have eternal life. There's a new man on the inside that is not affected by time. That's not affected by disease. That's not affected by anything. And when that trumpet sounds, this body is going to be changed from mortal to immortal. The corruptible, those that have died and time has had their toll on their lives and cancer and disease and death has eaten them and held them captive in the grave. That thing's going to be let loose and opened up and they're going to come up and rise up to meet the Savior. We're plugged in. Our eternity is a little bit different than God because ours had a starting place, but we're plugged into the eternal source. This theology lesson has a practical application. I'm tied in to somebody that's eternal. You know what? I need to live like it. We're headed for eternity. Everything's not about, okay, my life down here and what I'm going to leave my kids and how I can help out and all those things are good and great and grand, but that's not what it's all about. In the Bible, the focal point is always seeing Jesus. The focal point is always the judgment seat of Christ. The focal point is always eternity with God. We've turned it all about here. It's not all about down here. 
We've got to do some things down here. And the lesson we need to learn is, hey, I'm living for eternity. So that means I'm going to number my, my days and do what I'm supposed to do today. So, oh, I want to get on word. I've got to worry about, uh, man, the Lord's coming back. This thing's happening. Man, I just need to do this. Hold, 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 hold on. Let's just do tomorrow what we're supposed to do tomorrow. That's a big enough load on my plate right there. Let me just be accountable for what I'm supposed to be accountable for tomorrow. The right road will always lead down to the right place. He's in school. He don't need to quit school because Jesus is coming back. I thought Jesus was coming back 20 years ago when I was in school. Oh, I'm never going to get to do anything. Jesus is coming back. He didn't. He's not tarrying. He's coming on schedule. We need to do what we're supposed to do for today. You say, oh, preacher, I got all this stuff back in the past. Look at the past and learn from the past, but leave the past. You need to do what God wants you to do for right now. Thank God that He's eternal. I'm glad He's not limited and bound. I'm glad I can tie in to the one who's eternal. And even though death may destroy this body, even though time may keep going on, and we're like, oh, it can't go on, it can't go on, the country's falling, this is happening, I, I'm with you, I believe that. They could just keep marching on until we have our funeral. What are we going to do, sit around and be depressed about it? No. We serve the eternal God. We have eternal life, everlasting life. Death has no hold. All it is is just a quicker way to get to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with Him. That's just a quicker way. Paul, whenever he got stoned, I believe he died. I believe he saw the third heaven, came back down to the body. After that, he was a changed man. He was looking for opportunities to get killed. <laughs> it seemed like every time he turned around, somebody was trying to kill him. He didn't care. They were like, hey, we need to get out of this city. He's like, no, let's go back, let's go back. Paul, what's some, you act like you want to die or something. Uh, 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 well, you know, to depart and be with Christ is far better. Let's go back, let's go back. Man, he had a taste of it. And I'm not saying we need to be suicidal. <laughs> Please. God put something in every one of us who want to live. I understand that. But don't let it just pull you down and discourage you and depress you. We have everlasting life. We're going to absorb that. We're going to actually experience it in, in all the wonder of God's amazing grace when we get to heaven. I can't even describe it. So we need to rejoice in the eternal nature of God.